Ridge. My name is Jeff Gowling, the lead pastor, and I'm here with a couple of my buddies, a couple pastors on staff. Go ahead, guys, introduce yourselves. It's been a, a few weeks since you guys have been <laughs> yeah, on, actually. Yes, it's been a couple <laughs> weeks. So I'm Pastor Nate, uh, pastor of discipleship and outreach here at the Bridge. And I'm Pastor John, uh, the pastor over groups and connection. Yeah, so thanks for being with us. We have some questions to be uh, answering today that you submitted and a lot of good stuff to talk about with the Holy Spirit. And guys, um, we did two weeks on the Holy Spirit. Yep, yes, and did. so just a quick recap, because we, we didn't do a uh, theology podcast last week, but week one, I think the main point I would say uh, was that the Holy Spirit is a person, right? Not, not just an it, not just this force, impersonal kind of force, a, a person. That's important. Why? Because we're invited to have a personal relationship with God through the Holy Spirit who dwells with yeah. us. This uh, week two, we talked a little bit about some of the more contentious issues, I would say, with the Holy Spirit, uh, baptism mm -hmm. uh, of the Holy Spirit, those kinds of things. Uh, but also we talked about something that I think all believers can can really agree with, and that is there is uh, amazing power available uh, through the Holy Spirit for us to, to help us in living out um, our Christian lives. So that was fun two weeks for me. Well, and, and you got pretty excited talking about the power of the Spirit. <laughs> I that did was a little fun bit, to yeah. see. It's, it's fun to see you get kind of <laughs> revved up there. <laughs> Yeah, and thankfully the, the sermon video, you know, cut off the first few minutes, <laughs> so no one really knows how long I preached, because <laughs> it was a little we'll bit... keep it a secret. Thanks, yeah, guys. Yeah. It was a little bit too long, but let's start with a couple questions that we uh, received. Um, one question was a little bit, I think, seeking a little bit more clarification on what is the gift of tongues, speaking yeah. in tongues, and this person said, you know, isn't it a, isn't it a, a real foreign language? So you can hear that they're bent in that question that um, that maybe it's not a uh, a heavenly unknown language, but maybe it's just referring to a real foreign language. Um, I would like to read a couple scriptures that I think demonstrate or seem to show that it's maybe both okay. in different yeah, situations. Yeah. So yeah. so let's look at uh, first Acts chapter two because this is an important question, right? This is one of those that that definitely divides uh, believers into different churches sometimes. So uh, here's Acts chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 5. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Now, why were they Jews living in every nation? Well, there had been these uh, conquests of different uh, nations uh, and they had brought the Jews away into all of these different so they were had had really spread all throughout the world learning all kinds of different languages so there's Jews with all different kinds of languages there and at this sound the multitude came together so we're talking about the Pentecost when uh, you know all of the Jews are together in Pente they had, they had traveled to Jerusalem for Pentecost from all over the world this is where the tongues of fire the Holy Spirit's coming for the first time and they were bewildered. Why? Because each one of them, hearing each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Okay? And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one of us in our native language? So, hey, these Jews aren't the ones from all over the world. They're Galileans. They're in Galilee. Um, simple men in Galilee. Why is it that we're hearing? Um, what they're saying in our own language. Yeah. That certainly seems to indicate that tongues in that situation uh, was different foreign languages. Yeah. It was God empowering the Galileans to preach in a way that everyone that was there could hear, which is miraculous in and of itself, but definitely grounds it in human language. It, and, and for the sake of communicating the good news to those that need to hear. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit you just talked about. I mean, that's yeah. the stuff you gotta, you gotta take a second and just reflect on. Like, <laughs> yeah. God did this How incredible did work. Happen? This is why we love Pentecost, is, <laughs> right? The Holy Spirit comes down, everybody's hearing the gospel in their own language. It's like, yeah. 
Bing, bang, boom. We got it. <laughs> it must have been astonishing also for those that were speaking, yeah. right? It's like, you can imagine all of a sudden starting speaking, uh, you know, Japanese or yeah. something. It's like, whoa. Well, I've always actually wondered, <laughs> and maybe that's part of the miraculousness too, is if all of them were hearing it in their own language, was it different people speaking in their language or yeah. was it them speaking and they're just thinking that they're speaking normal oh, and, they're and each of them is in, in one sense hearing <laughs> through the Holy Spirit. I mean, there's even within that, just that yeah. nuance of like, hey, in what way did God choose to yeah. work? in power in some ways it doesn't matter he, he worked in power in a way that allowed them to hear in their own language the good news either way it was crazy yeah what god was doing <laughs> the holy spirit was whoa doing something now i want to read a different passage that also talks about tongues that seems to maybe have a little bit different nuance so let's turn now to first corinthians uh chapter 14 first corinthians chapter 14 uh and starting in verse let's look at verse 2 for one who speaks in a tongue, Paul is now, you know, addressing the church in Corinth, right? So obviously they're doing some stuff and he's just making sure they're doing it right. Um, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. Okay, so no one's understanding him. Mysteries in the spirit seems to me to be something different than a uh, a normal uh, foreign language yeah. there. Uh, let, me, let me add a couple other verses and then just get your comments on this, guys. Look at verses 13 and 14. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. <laughs> so again, you know, my spirit praying, my mind not really comprehending this language that I'm speaking. So I don't know, seems to indicate more of what is referred to as a heavenly language or a, uh, you know, a way for my spirit to be praying to God. What, what do you think on that, guys? Well, I mean, I would honestly add two more verses that come towards the end of yeah. it, at verses 27, 28. Now Paul's talking about the orderly use of tongues yeah. within the church. Yep. And he says, if any speaks in a tongue, let there be only two or three at most, each in turn. So this is orderly, let someone interpret. Yep. So it's say what happened in a church is you'd have to have someone interpret. But then the next verse says, but if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Hmm. Paul's directly addressing them. <laughs> hey, if that's not the available avenue, guess what? Your tongue is for you to speak to yourself and to God. Yeah. So there's something going on there that this is some type of communication for Paul, clearly teaching here, hey, it's first and foremost between you and God. Now, somehow it might spill over to the church and be important for them, but somehow it's between you and God. That would start to say, mm. well, maybe it's not that foreign language. That seems a little bit different than yeah. what happened in Acts 2. Well, because why would you need to pray in order to hope that someone can interpret? If it's, a, if it's a human language in that moment, then it's like, hey, only speak that if there's someone there who knows that language. Yeah. But this is Paul instructing, saying, hey, pray that there's someone who can interpret what's being mm. spoken so that, again, it's for the edifying of the body. Um, in some streams of the church, they call this, and I think it, they're trying to get at, hey, maybe Maybe this isn't so much like Nate's saying for the worship gathering, but they, they call it a prayer language. Mm -hmm. they, they don't even say it's, you know, speaking in tongues as much as it's a prayer language. It's you and the Lord. It's that communion that you're having where your heart is at work and you're praying with the spirit. Um, but it's not about interpretation or even the corporate gathering. It's actually about just you and the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I uh, you know, I did say on Sunday that I have uh, not been given the gift of tongues. I've, I've not used, whether it be a foreign language, well, I speak some French, uh, but I grew up in Canada speaking French. But, but like God's empowerment, that's more natural. Yeah, I don't know. I think it was just seventh and eighth grade uh, immersion. But um, yeah, but I've not, uh, you know, had this prayer language. But, you know, even just, even just the other day, talking to another friend, describing it as um, this sort of bubbling up inside of them that they don't quite understand, but just this bubbling up of some f sort of language and they just start speaking it. And for them, it is just this, yeah, prayer. Like it's a way of worshiping God as well. Their spirit, I guess, worshiping the spirit. So, um, uh, you know, I'm, uh, even though I don't uh, enjoy using that gift myself, I'm, I'm not going to deny that these others are having that wonderful experience. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think 
you know, what this starts to come down to is we get a little bit uncomfortable with yeah. uh, the miraculous gifts and what this looks mm-hmm. like. And we see the abuses yeah. of them too, yeah. right? And yeah. this is this is always clearly what comes up in this conversation, whether you're talking about tongues or prophecy or healing, whatever it is, we see the abuses of it. You see a, a, another Christian brother saying, hey, if you don't speak in tongues, I don't know if you're saved. Yeah. Right? And you see that that kind of abuse that doesn't show up in scripture, we would pretty clearly say and we say ooh that gets that gets scary maybe we need to stay away from that that tongues conversation entirely yeah, yeah. but at the same time and Paul's encouraging the church to go seek after tongues and to go seek after these miraculous gifts i, I you can't really do away with that part either and that's where that cessationist versus continuationist kind of line of thinking those two camps came up throughout your yeah. your sermon on sunday well, you mentioned it. Let's talk about that a little bit. You know, the cessationist view, and frankly, it's one that I learned in seminary and was kind of taught that way, um, that these more miraculous, what they call sign gifts, were intended only during this apostolic time, these t- the times of the apostles, to demonstrate that God was doing something new, that he was, for the first time ever, bringing the Holy Spirit to dwell in all believers, and also sort of this authority affirmation of the, the work of the apostles that they were doing. But that after this initial age of the apostles, that gifts of uh, tongues and prophecy and healing, um, they cease. They cease. That's where cessationist comes from. And they're no longer active today. So what, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that, guys? <laughs> mm. I mean, you even look at the fact that the Holy Spirit, if we believe that the Holy Spirit is part of what God has used to protect God's word and make sure that we receive it as God intended, is if that's the case, then why continue to protect Paul's encouragement that was only for a season, only for a people? Mm. And if you look at the breadth of scripture, God has always been doing something some sort of miraculous work on behalf of his people. And he usually includes people in that process. And so the idea that God is just going to work outside of his followers and his people, that this is just for that time, it begs the question, then why would that still be left for us and preserved for us to say, hey, look at the encouragement of one of the apostles to the church to say, hey, this is how we are meant to conduct ourselves. This is what the Holy Spirit's gonna do in and through you. And here's how you conduct yourself in a way that actually builds up the church yeah yeah and it's just it's one of those clear hey christians are on both sides of this one faithful christians believe they're cessationists or believe they're continuationists uh and they're still faithful christians right it's one of the things we we keep kind of harping on we can have those kinds of disagreements Mm -hmm. i think for me you look at you look at scripture yes you could try to make an argument that the apostles had these gifts particularly to witness to the incarnation or the revelation of Jesus there's a few verses that may seem to lean that way but at the same time what we just read 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 <laughs> Paul's talking to a normal church in Corinth not a bunch of super apostles yeah. not a bunch of special people yep. just a normal church in Corinth yep. and he's encouraging them have the gift of tongues. He's encouraging them, there is a gift of healing. Pursue that. And he's saying there is a gift of prophecy. Pursue yeah. that. Yeah. It's a little hard to get around that evidence too that he's just telling that to a normal church continue he, to use those gifts. Nate, he even says in verse five of chapter 14, now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophecy. <laughs> you know, so this seems like, whoa, if that gift is ceasing, why is he instructing the church? And like John said, why is it left for us to say, hey, I want all of you to do that. But in that verse, he's particularly saying, but even more so, I want you to have the gift and use the gift of prophecy. Can we talk about that for a minute? <laughs> yes. So what is the gift of prophecy? These two sides, right? Is it is it a uh, foretelling of the future or is it foretelling just sort of a proclamation of truth? Thoughts on that? Yeah. I, what I always do when I think about the gift of prophecy is I go back to the Old Testament prophets um, and I think about what was the primary thing that they did. Mm-hmm. The primary thing is they communicated God's truth to actually encourage Israel and convict Israel of sin. It was very often that forth-telling mm. aspect where they're forth-telling God's truth in a powerful way to people who need to be 
often shaken up a little bit. They need to have some powerful conviction or some powerful encouragement coming their way. And so I think that's often the role that the prophet plays is forth telling that truth. Yeah, I think the people that I've encountered that seem to have that gift are ones that um, God seems to give them wisdom and insight into a particular situation. They, they witness someone or hear about their situation and they just have this discernment to say, hey, God's truth actually applies here in this situation. And it's not just the eyes to see it, but it's the boldness. Like that's the other characteristic of the prophets mm-hmm. is like yeah. the boldness to potentially confront someone yeah. on their sin or to speak encouragement and, and boldly into someone's life to say, hey, if I know God's character and God's word rightly, and I look at your situation, I think God really wants you to do this thing. Or I want, I think he wants you to respond in this way. Or I think he wants you to turn from this thing because it's actually out of line from what he would want for you. And so it's that marked behavior that they're bold, but have eyes to see or that ability to discern in that situation what God's best is in that particular moment. Yeah, and, and it seems as if Paul is saying this is a gift to use to encourage the body, to edify the body, to build people up, right? He's saying, hey, tongues, if there's no interpretation, I mean, it's sort of useless for the body, you know, but uh, prophecy is one that we can edify one another. And so what a beautiful thing to even pray for that, you know, as I pray, you know, helper, would you use me today in some form of of prophecy to speak truth into someone's life, to encourage them, to edify them in some way. And, you know, I gave that example that happened in my life, you know, of uh, um, with someone on the staff, you know, and I think that's uh, that's an issue there of sort of prophecy of using that, hey, here's, here's truth that the Holy Spirit is speaking to try to encourage you yeah. in yeah. your life. Um, how about healing, the gift of healing? What do we think about that? I mean, I think it, this is one more of those kind of miraculous sign gifts. So it falls in a, in a similar category. You, you'd have to wrestle with Paul teaching the church that there is a, a, a gift here that can be used. You'd have to wrestle with all the times you see it Throughout scripture, obviously it's a sign of what Jesus and his power can do for us, actually heal us of our physical as an affirmation that he can heal our spiritual lives, right? That's the most important thing, those spiritual lives, but it's an affirmation of what his power can do. And so Mm. I think it's another one of those where you say, man, it, it looks like Paul's teaching it may not always appear, especially here in North America, we see the abuses of the, the person who says, hey, mm-hmm. uh, you know, everybody needs to be able to heal all the time. And we're yeah, like, that yeah. doesn't look like what scripture's teaching. We, we don't believe in that necessarily. Or but if you send in your financial gift, there's even a greater <laughs> chance of getting healed exactly. today. I mean, those abuses. Those exist. abuses. And that's what we want to stay away yep, from, yeah. right? But mm-hmm. maybe you could say a similar abuse is to say, hey, the spirit stopped working. Yeah. Nobody can heal anybody anymore. Yeah. That yeah. could be a similar downfall yeah. on the other side. And yeah. going around the world, I think all of us have heard stories that global church experiences yeah. this in a much greater way because I think yeah. they have a much greater faith that Jesus can mm-hmm. actually do it. Mm-hmm. And yet even in that, there is that danger that I always feel of like saying, well, if you have faith, then mm-hmm. healing is available. Like there, there's such the potential for a spiritual shame yeah. in that of like, mm-hmm. well, if I was just more spiritual, I yeah. could experience the yes. healing of the Lord. And yet yeah. I, I do think that there is some, it seems as though it is much less common in, in the United States to experience that because each of us have been outside and, and heard those stories and seen those things. And that seems more normative in some other places Mm -hmm. and so it maybe it's a faith thing but Mm -hmm. maybe it's you know satan at work in other ways Mm -hmm. undermining our Mm -hmm. ability to believe the the holy spirit will work and do those things and being open to that yeah fantastic guys let's move on to a little bit different topic here with the few minutes that we have left um how about this question of um the holy spirit uh, speaking to us. And so if, if God still speaks through the Holy Spirit, um, how does he do that? In what forms does he do that? I talked about that a little bit on, um, on Sunday, but what, what are some of your own thoughts and experiences with that? Oh, man, I, I hope and pray that every believer can recall mm-hmm. just yeah. the moments where the Spirit has spoken to them clearly. Yeah. I hope and pray all of us. That's my first thought is I hope all of us, <laughs> yeah. this isn't a very tough question to answer in some ways. Mm. I, and, I, and I know it may be a struggle for different people listening and I think that's okay, but I think it's something and hey, we wanna seek what the Spirit wants to say to us and hopefully yeah. we wanna have those moments with them. I, I think for me, 
you know, one of the ways that pops out that I know was, was in your message, but just to make clear, I think he speaks through scripture, right? He's, yeah. he's given us this word. Um, we, we believe that he speaks through it. And I've experienced that in a real way in my own life mm. where even in my call to ministry, when I was after my freshman year of college debating, hey, should I keep going down this engineering path or should I, you know, maybe move down this ministry path I feel like God's calling me to? How did the spirit start to confirm what he was doing? Once I picked up the word and I felt mm. led to these different passages where call, God called different people to, to go down that path, to, to live their lives for him. So I, I remember reading the calling of Moses who felt like he didn't have the right words to say. And God says, well, I'll be your mouthpiece. I'll figure it out for you, right? Yeah. Or I remember the disciples and God calling them and, and the word that stuck out is they immediately left their nets. Mm, and yeah. to me at that moment, the spirit was convicting me. Mm. I hadn't immediately been leaving anything. I was holding <laughs> on to these things, right? And then at yeah. the end of all that, after reading scripture, then the spirit convicts me of, of my own sin in this area mm -hmm. that I was maybe clinging to engineering because I wanted my own financial security, my mm -hmm. own financial stability, that I wasn't trusting God, right? And that was mm -hmm. not coming directly from a page of scripture, but it was God speaking through this whole process mm -hmm. to me. So, love it. you know, the beautiful it. moment, it's still yeah. like seared in my memory, oh. like what that night was like, yeah. right? Yeah. I love it, yeah. I think the other way in is just in community, right? Like he, God uh, speaks through fellow believers. Like mm -hmm. if, if each of us is indwelled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not going to contradict himself from one believer to another, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think part of the way is that when you feel that nudge or that leading by the Holy Spirit is going to fellow believers and say, hey, I think the Lord's prompting me to do this or mm -hmm. to uh, act in obedience in this way. And then I think you're able to say like, hey, does that sound like God as far as you know? Oh, like, yeah. does that sound like something the Holy Spirit would be leading and yeah. looking for that affirmation and confirmation from your community to say, no, that definitely sounds like the Holy Spirit. That yeah, definitely yeah. sounds like what God would do. Yeah. Um, but within that, I, and this is my personal story, is that it can take other forms, right? Like, it, uh, we had a friend who, um, before we had even um, gotten the call about the bridge or the opportunity here, um, it was summer. And so it was like six months at least before we were even, a bridge was even on our radar. Mm. Uh, she came to us and she said, hey, I've been asking the Lord to speak to me um, and I've been starting to have dreams and I had a dream and I, I think I'm supposed to just tell you. And so she, she laid out this dream. She told us about it. She's like, I don't know what the Lord wants to do with that. I don't even know if that's something that God's going to choose to use, but like, I want to mm. tell you about it. Mm. Um, and my wife and I just held on to that. Ellie and I just yeah. held on to that. And uh, when Brandon had called and said, Hey, we have this opening. You should come check it out. The first service we came to mm. um, the language of the dream, the things that she described, the imagery of the dream, the things that she described were part of the worship gathering that night. Mm -hmm. I mean, to the point where we hadn't done an interview, we hadn't done anything. And, and Ellie turns to me and says, I think we're moving to Bakersfield. <laughs> and so I think, you know, we, we talk about the, you know, does God still do miraculous things? I think he speaks yeah. through affirmation and discernment from community. But I do think he sometimes takes these other ways of visions and dreams and uses them as confirmation that God, it, Ellie, and I saw it as like it was God like waving his hands above mm. us saying hey pay attention I'm yeah. about to do something yeah. here oh, and it was our, his way of getting our attention beautiful and um, you know w one thing I think guys we really want to emphasize here too and this would be a warning and that is that as God does speak through the helper in our lives to us or maybe when he uses someone else like he did with you John um, as the spirit speaks in that way it always is going to align with truth in scripture. It's never going to contradict what God has already spoken. I think that is so important. So, so if God, if, if that person comes to you and says, hey, John, I just really want to encourage you that God, I feel like God wants me to tell you that you are his son and you are loved and you can be secure knowing who you are in him. That's a beautiful truth that aligns with scripture. Yeah. You can say, hey, that's, that might be the Holy Spirit that's mm -hmm. speaking in there. But if someone were to come, a, a guy were come and say, hey, Jeff, you know, I've been praying and the spirit has really been impressing on my heart. He's really been speaking to me uh, that I should move in with my girlfriend and that it's okay for us to be living together. And just really, really feel the spirit's conviction there. I can very confidently tell him that may be a spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit <laughs> that is speaking yeah. to you because that's 
in direct co contradiction with truth that God has already revealed in Scripture and how he speaks will never contradict Scripture. Yeah. And, and that's the point is, right, the canon of Scripture, that's closed, and we know yeah. God has spoken through this, right? Yes. And so we are certain of the words and the truths that are in here, right? Yeah. And so anything we, we believe we're hearing, whether it comes from another believer in a vision or in our own dream or that thought that you say, you know, in your sermon, it's often just a thought God impresses upon yeah. me, just sticks in my heart. Whatever that is, we can check it against this, right? Mm. The Bible even says, hey, test the spirits. Make sure it's yes. from God, right? Why would it say that if not to say that the Spirit's going to continue to speak to you and yeah. you have to test that speaking? And yeah. this is the, the first and foremost thing mm. you test that against is, hey, is this something that lines up with this closed canon of Scripture? Yeah. But it's not to deny the spirit is still mm. alive. He's still guiding people into all truth. Mm. He's still convicting them of sin. Mm. He's still reminding us what Jesus taught. Like all of those things mm. are true. Applying that into our lives, the spirit is still well alive and active. Yeah. What a Thank great you. way to finish. <laughs> what a great way to finish. And, and don't let Satan tell us otherwise, yes. right? Yes. Don't let him mm. try to tell us that, oh no, God's done. He doesn't really want to use you. He doesn't really want to speak to you or use you in any way. Man, uh, that is such a lie yes. from the father of lies. Yes. But what a great way to end to make sure that we confirm what he is speaking through scripture because this is absolutely reliable 100% of the time. My friends, thank you for being with us. Uh, what, a, what a great discussion that we had today. I hope you really enjoyed that. Um, don't forget, we love to receive and answer almost all of your questions uh, that, we, that we receive. So uh, you can give those questions through emailing podcast at thebridgebiblechurch.com or through Instagram, and we'll receive those and hopefully be able to answer them. Uh, also, don't forget to subscribe uh, here to this channel so that you will know when we uh, release these videos because sometimes they come a day late, like this week, right? And, but you'll, still, you'll yes. still get it. And we would love to invite you, if you've never been uh, to a Bridge Worship gathering. Uh, 10 a.m. outside in our courtyard. Uh, we'll be gathering for worship or it's available live stream online. Uh, this week, let's see, Pastor Nate, you're on. Yes, and I we're going to be up. talking about the... We're going to be talking about the sacraments. Yeah. So we're going to talk baptism and communion. It's going to be a beautiful Sunday. We get to take <laughs> communion together. Oh, yeah. I'm incredibly excited about <laughs> it. There's a lot of good depth and truth to talk about with these topics. So. Fantastic. So we'll see you there, my friends. God bless. Love you.